Turn to Revelation chapter 3. Y'all, we made it to chapter 3. Tell your neighbor congratulations. I know it feels like we're 14 weeks into Revelation and we're only on chapter 3, but we, we made it. So we're talking about, about Sardis today. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know if you've noticed this in your life. Have you noticed that sometimes there is a great difference between things as they appear and then, and then the reality of the situation when you get a little closer. I'll never forget this image as long as I live. I think I was still maybe an intern here or, or shortly after I came on staff as in youth ministry, but I was, I was at the light, right? Getting ready to, to turn left into the Widden Auditorium. I was at the light and I looked and I saw the, one of the baddest, toughest Harley biker dudes that I've ever seen. Half helmet, sunglasses, the beard, leather vest cut off at the sleeves, tattoos, big muscles. I mean, I mean, this guy, you did not want to mess with this guy. And so that's why, that's why I tried to cover up really hard my, my laughing as I looked from him and then glanced down and saw that he was riding not, not a Harley, but a, but a scooter. I'm like, I'm like, oh, Lord, turn that light green, <laughs> like, re really, really quickly. Like, some, sometimes, what's on the, where are my children of the 90s at? Where are my, where, my, where my skater kids at? Y'all remember, y'all remember the skater cuts that went down over the eye and the oversized T-shirts and the, the baggy pants and the vans and everything like that. Do you remember the name that the skaters used to call the other kids that wore the stuff but never got on the skateboard. Y'all remember that, that they called them posers. They called them posers because there was this external appearance, but what was on the inside didn't match up to what was going on the outside. Revelation chapter 3, the, the, the letter to the church of Sardis reads like this. And to the angel of the church of Sardis write the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have, you have the reputation. Say reputation. The outside. The externals. You got the reputation of being alive. But you're dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you don't wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. That, by the way, the, the thief in the night scripture does, isn't written to the world. It's written to a church that's asleep. Remember what you've received and heard. You still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, which I will never blot out his name from the book of life. I will confess his name before my God and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You got a reputation for being alive but you're dead. Often there is a difference between reputation and a reality. Let me say it this way. Sometimes there is a difference between our image self and our true self. What's our image self? Our image self is who I want you to believe that I am. It's what I want you to think about me. This is, this is your social media self. This is your Instagram self. This is your TikTok self. And then there's your true self. This is who I am really. This is who I am when nobody else is looking. See, no matter what age we are, we all have the image of us, which is on the outside, and then on the inside, the core of us, we have our true self, and there is a gap between our true self and our image self. So the wider the gap between your image self and your true self, the greater the stress, fear, and anxiety in your life. Let me, can I preach this to, to the teenagers in the house? Because what is the pressure on every teenager that you got to keep up a certain 
image. You got to you got to know the right movies and you got to wear the right clothes and you got to have this image and there's so much pressure upon the next generation to keep up this image on the outside and what's what can nothing wrong with wearing certain clothes but if that image isn't true to who you are watch this this is where this is the root of actually this can be the root of stress fear and anxiety in your life because you're stressed that other people are going to find out who you really are. And then you're fearful that once they find out who you really are, that they won't like you. And then you are anxious that people will leave you in your life. Bring up those, bring up those circles again. So this is all like, this is, do we have that on the, there we go. Like, this is, this is true of all of us. How many of you know, though, that once you get a little older, the, let me just say it like this, uh, you don't care as much. Amen. When, after, like, there's stages to this, like, right, once you get married, you don't care as much. Can I just say that some of y'all need to care a little bit more? <laughs> somebody, somebody said, I'm not looking at anybody, somebody told me, Pastor, that's false advertising. But, but once you reach, once you reach, I told somebody one time, I was like, I was younger, I was younger, I said, I wonder what the age is that you get to and you just wake up and you decide, I don't like new stuff at all anymore. Like, I don't like new music, I don't get it, I can't understand it, it doesn't make sense to me. And then, and then the words that used to mean things don't mean what they used to mean, so used to be when somebody told me something was fine, it used to mean it was fine, and now it means that they don't like it, and I'm confused <laughs> by like what, <laughs> by words like, that's fine, oh, that's good. No, it just means that, anyway, like now you're going rehearsing, oh, they told me that I looked fine the other day. They didn't mean that. If they were under 20, they didn't mean that it, that it, was, that it was fine. And like all of these different things, but I, but I found that age. It was, it was mid-40s in my life. I woke up and I just decided I like what I like to eat. I like the restaurants that I like, and when I go to that restaurant, I'm going to get the same thing because I don't want to be disappointed. I'm on. So as you, as you, as so like twenty somethings in the house, thirty somethings in the house, teenagers in the house. Can I tell you that the <laughs> this image it gets better, it gets better, but we still all struggle with it. There's still, all, there's still all of us that have this image self. There are parts of us that on the outside, we're living this way that if we were honest, I'm living this way so that somebody will like me or think better of me or I want them to, whatever it is. But then we've got the core of who we are. So when you close this gap, remember the wider the gap, the more fear, anxiety, and stress that you have in your life. The smaller the gap, the greater the peace, joy, and confidence. You're confident of who you are in Christ. You have peace because of that. And then you have great joy that the people who are in your life are there for the right reasons. There is such peace in that. I don't have to pretend to be somebody else for my friends and my family to like me. They like me because either if they're your friends, they really like you, or they're your family, they have to. But whatever, whatever the reason, it's, it's real, and there's a peace in that. So today I want to close the gap. Whether you're, whether you're 14 or 40 or 84, I want to close the gap. Three thoughts from the scripture. Number one, your image self is asleep, but your true self is awake. Your image self is asleep, but your true self is awake. The first thing that it said is in verse two, it says, wake up, wake up. What did you notice? Did you notice something about Sardis that was different from the other churches? This was one of the things that was different about Sardis than the other churches. There was something missing. Did you catch it? There was no persecution in Sardis on the like everything seemed to be going good in Sardis but can I tell you that sometimes we ask Jesus to remove all of the trouble from our lives but it's the trouble that's keeping us spiritually alive and awake 
God didn't cause it, but he can use it. There's a lot of things in our world that I wish would change, but what if God is allowing those things to come so a sleeping church would wake up and rise up to their potential in the power of Jesus? I don't want to go through what we went through, but if what we went through causes the church of Jesus Christ to wake up to our authority, to wake up to our identity, to wake up to our true selves, to stop being concerned with the image of church, oh, does the world like us? Are they going to accept us? Are they okay with us? No, we are going to live out of the core of who we are in Jesus, and that is a powerful self. How many of you know if you live if you live true to the words you're going to offend people? Now don't live offensive. Pastor just gave me permission to be a jerk. No, I didn't. The way in which we present ourselves. We want to live at peace with as many people as as possible. We want to use kindness in our words, but the core of who we are Because we believe in absolute truth, because we believe in the word of God, there will be people who get offended. There's a theologian by the name of G.B. Card. He calls the church of Sardis the perfect model of inoffensive Christianity. George Eldon Ladd said it like this. The Sardis church was a picture of nominal Christianity, outwardly prosperous Busy with the externals of religious activity, but devoid of spiritual life and power. When we're so concerned about the image of us as a Christian, oh, I just want, I just want people to like me. They won't. I mean, let me just, like, some people will, but some people won't. And so if your goal is for everybody to like you, then when they don't, You'll be tempted to live in the image of you instead of living out of your true self. When we're concerned about our image self, you think the goal of life is to live safe and not offend anybody. That's not the goal. The goal is truth and love. Second thing, our image self coasts on past successes. Our true self builds on past successes. So our image self coasts on past successes. Our true self builds on past successes. The end of verse 2. For I have not found your works complete. That tells me that the church of Sardis, they had a good church planting Sunday. They had a good first Sunday. They had a good good promotion plan. They They were growing. They were reaching their community. Their children's ministry was thriving. They had a good outreach. They, they might have had a dream set. Like they got off to a, a, a great start. And yet Jesus says what, what happened, like you started out with power, but then you got more concerned about what other people thought about you than what I think about you. By the way, that's the core of identity issues is when you're more concerned about what other people think about you than what Jesus thinks about you. So it's not that you are not concerned with what others think about you. It's just that you're way more concerned with how God thinks about you. And then when you return to that, you return to your true identity. So Sardis started out really good, but then they, then they started coasting. Je- Jesus is in, in 2022, Jesus is not impressed in, for, about what you did with, for him in 2019. Like he's thankful for it. He hopes you build on it. But he's not impressed with the missions trip you went on in 2019. He's not impressed with the, with the person you led to, to Jesus in 2018. Like, does that, like, that sounds harsh and like, you can take that to an extreme, but what I'm trying to do is just paint a picture that sometimes we can live in the memory of the good old days, whatever that means. I wrote down that there's three types of churches, and you could substitute companies here, sports franchises, people, but there's three types of churches. One, churches that coast on their past success. You know any companies like that? How about some companies that were killing it in the 80s? What what about the dot-com boom companies of the early 2000s? What about some of these companies even five years ago, right? And And now they, what happened? Some of them 
coasted on past success instead of reinventing themselves. So we say, you say something like this, well, I don't want to be that church. I don't want to be the church that lives in the glory days. And, and that preaches really well until you start saying, well, we have to make changes to meet the future. And see, see cha change is the hard thing. Like we say, we want to we want to be a church of the future, amen. And then we have to change to get there. I don't. I like. I like. Oh, forty-five year old Doug just kicked in. And when I'm speaking of forty-five, I'm speaking in the past tense because I'm a little bit past that now. But we'll say forty-something. We'll use the term forty-something. How's that? Here's here's what happens. We can't ever. In the church world, we can't ever confuse substance with style. Our substance will never change. The cross of Jesus Christ will never change. The blood of Jesus will never change. We will always preach resurrection. We will always preach the fullness of the Holy Spirit. We, everything, if the Bible says it, we're going to say it, whether it's popular or not. So our substance will never, hear me, our substance will never change. But our style, Pastor Bill, if he preached in tennis shoes, 30 years ago, they would have yanked you off the platform. <laughs> but it's style. So we have to submit. We all, if we're going to be a church of generations, we all have to lay our style down. Right? And here's the, this is not a younger thing or an older thing. This is... Some of the older generation, we got to lay down some of our preferences for the younger generation. But the younger generation, we got to lay down some of our preferences for the older generation. Like, I don't, it's not about the, here's what I've come to. It isn't about the shoes. I'll wear a three-piece suit. I don't have one, so y'all need to buy one for me. Just kidding. I have a couple. But I'll wear, like, I don't care. I'll wear whatever it takes to reach as many people as possible. It's about the power of God. It's about the presence of God. And as long as we are proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, we got, we've got, there are churches that coast on past success, churches that abandon their past success. So I don't want to be that church either and forget our history and forget our legacy and forget our heritage. Are you kidding me? I was in the prayer place this morning and I was walking and I just started praying, God, I call on the prayer. I call forth the prayers of the ancestors that have been prayed for 65 years over this county, over this area. I'm so thankful for our heritage and I don't ever want to be the newer, cooler church that abandons our past. We build on that past. And so that's the third type. One, coast on past success. Two, abandon past success. The third thing is we build on and multiply out of past success. For I have not found your works complete. Can I make it personal? What has God called you to that you need to complete? I know you're ready to move on to the next thing, but did you complete the last thing? What was your last assignment, and were you faithful to complete the thing that God asked you to do? Here's the third thing. Our image self doesn't realize what's in us, but our true self accesses what's in us. Our image self doesn't realize what's in us, but our true self accesses what's in us. In order to realize, in order to access what is in you, you've got to realize what's in you. It says, strengthen what remains, strengthen what remains and is about to die. Some people would say it like this, pastor, I've been living a lie so long, I, didn't, I don't even know what's real anymore. I don't know who I am. I've been living so long trying to please people. I've been living so long trying to be the person I thought that somebody else wanted me to be. I've been living so long trying to live up to expectations from other people that may or may not be true. For some of you, you're living an image self out of expectations that you put from you on the other person and then read back onto you that the other person never had about you to begin with. 
You see how complicated this gets? Well, how do we do this? How do we break? You got to break that. You got to break that. You got to break that fear. You got to break that anxiety. Well, what if they don't like the real me? What if they do? You got to access the best of you. You've got to access the core of who Jesus called you to be. So how do you do that? Well, let's go to, let's go to Jacob. Let me finish by telling you the story of Jacob. So Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob, one of the fathers of the faith. Jacob, one of the greatest men in the, the Old Testament scriptures, carrier of the promises of God, uh, the founder of the, the nation of Israel and the namesake and the, from the lineage and from the heritage that he'd received. So I want you to see the generational blessing that was passed on from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The, the promises of God are bigger than any one generation. It takes all the generations to get all the promises. And so... Uh, basically, Jacob was living this life where things would go wrong in his life and he would get mad and he would blame somebody and then he would run from the person and run from the problem. And so he had a dad that did not speak into his identity. Abraham Isaac, that was Isaac. Again, like great father, great father of the faith, just not the best father. Aren't you thankful that scripture tells us the good about people and the bad about people and it doesn't sugarcoat it at all? So you had Isaac that wasn't the best earthly father. And so Jacob grew up with some daddy issues, having a father that never really supported him, loved him, spoke into his identity. And so you had this blame of Jacob to Isaac. Well, Isaac's not going to give me what I need, so I'm going to need to operate in trickery and deceit and pretend that I'm Esau, pretend that I'm Esau living out of his image self instead of his true self because my true self isn't good enough to receive what God had for me. So I got to pretend to be somebody else in order to get the blessing. And so uh, uh, Isaac's mama, Rebecca, try, or, or Jacob's mother, Rebecca, try, helped him in this deceptive plot. And he went to his dad who was old and blind and couldn't, couldn't really uh, see and, and tricked his father into giving him his blessing. Well, now he got, you know whose blessing he got? He got Esau's blessing. So now he's got his brother mad at him. But guess what Jacob does? Instead of admitting his mistake, now he's blaming Esau. If Esau just would have given me the, the, the stew to begin with, if, if you know, my dad would have blessed me, if Esau would have, would have helped me out. And so he's, he's blaming and he starts to run. He starts to run. He leaves the house and he goes out into the wilderness. And in Genesis 28, he meets God at Bethel. And it changes a little bit, but then he goes on to Laban. So Laban, uh, he starts working for Laban. Laban's a relative. And he sees this girl that he wants to marry, Rachel, and he works seven years for Laban to marry Rachel. By the way, dads, here's a way to tell if that guy that your teenage daughter is dating is good enough to be in your family. Is he willing to work for seven years for you in order to win her hand in marriage? I would just throw that out as a litmus test right there. So he works for seven years. Big wedding day. Marries Rachel. Or so he thought. He wakes up and it's Leah. I know, read about it. It's crazy. That's not my point. I'm going to move on. And so he works another seven years, marries, marries Rachel, and then he works for Laban. And Laban promises him some stuff because he was a shepherd and the, his flocks were, and everything was being blessed and he was overseeing the business. And Laban should have released blessing on him, but now Laban doesn't release blessing on him. And now Jacob's blaming his dad because his dad never spoke into his identity and is blaming his brother because his brother should have been right with him, but his brother was against him. And now he's blaming Laban because Laban should have blessed him and he runs again and he's blame and run and blame and run and he has another encounter with God this time in Genesis 35 in Bethel and this is when the angel of the Lord comes down from heaven and wrestles Jacob. It's a cool story y'all and when it says the angel of the Lord Lord is in all caps and so it means Jesus so basically Jesus comes down from heaven and enters into this WWE wrestling match with Jacob. I, I wonder what Jesus' theme music was coming down. Like, I bet that was good theme. I bet, I bet he had an entourage. And so in my mind, then a, a ring appears because you can't have a wrestling match without a ring. So a ring's got to be there, right? And they're like suplexes going on and DDTs and, and, and people jumping off the top rope. And in my Bible, that's the way it's playing out, like this amazing wrestling match. And they wrestle all night. 
Like, give it, give it to my boy Jacob, right? Like, wrestling Jesus, and he lasts all night against Jesus. And finally, in the morning, Jesus gets Jacob in a headlock, and he asks Jacob a very important question. Do you remember it? He says, Jacob, what is your... Well, he doesn't say Jacob. He says, tell me your name. Tell me your name. Because in Hebrew culture, your name was connected to your identity the core of who you were. Remember what Jacob's done all his life. He's run. Blame other people. It's never my fault. It's never my fault. It's never my fault. It's never my fault. And he's running and blaming and running and blaming. Jesus has him in a headlock. What is your name? Jacob's not young, y'all. Jacob's about 90 years old. Now I'm really impressed. He didn't just last in a wrestling match with Jesus when he was 30. He was 90. No broken, well, hip kind of dislocated, but hey, that happens. <laughs> but Jesus says, tell me your name. And for the first time in his life, Jacob confronts who he really is. And he says, Jacob. And Jacob means deceiver. For the first time in his life, he says, it's not my dad's fault. For the first time in his life, he says, it's not my brother's fault. For the first time in his life, he says, it's not my boss's fault. I'm owning the worst of me. I'm owning the core of my identity. And you would think that Jesus would say, that's right, you jerk. Finally, you admit who you are. I don't want anything to do with you. But that's not what Jesus does. Jesus says, finally. Finally, now that you've admitted the worst of you, now I can bless you. You're not Jacob any longer. You're Israel. He that struggles with God and has overcome, and I bless you. I bless you to prosper. I bless you to carry out the destiny of God on your life. Some of you have spent your entire life running from the worst of you, and until you confront it, God can't change it. He can't bless you. This is a confrontation service today. God said he wants you to confront some things. He said he doesn't want you to confront anybody else. He wants you to confront you. With heads bowed and eyes closed, some of you have been running all your life. I know it's, it wasn't your fault. It was not your fault, but I want you to confront who you are. If you never confront the worst of you, you'll never access the best of you. The worst of you and the best of you are actually two sides to the same coin. And Jesus wants you to know that he will not avoid the worst of you. He will invade the worst of you. And he will redeem it into a blessing, but not until you confront it. So I know you've been running. I know you've been running. I want you to picture yourself. What have you been running from? What have you been running from? What sin have you been running from? What identity flaw have you been running from? And you've been living your entire life pretending to be Esau, pretending to be somebody else just so somebody will like you. And you may have gotten the other person to like you, but now you don't even like yourself. And you're not sure of who you are. But God sent this word today so that you would confront. Stop running. Stop running. And Jesus just says, tell me your name. Tell me your name. Tell me your name. You don't have to do it out loud, but would you just begin to begin to tell Jesus the worst of you? Begin to tell Jesus that secret. Begin to tell Jesus the thing that when you look in the mirror, you don't like about yourself. And as soon as you release it, he'll release blessing in the name of Jesus. As soon as you release it in that confession moment, he'll release a new identity over you in the name of Jesus. These are two specific things that I felt some, somebody, several people, in fact, in the house, you've lived your entire life not just living a lie, but you've been telling lies. And you, you actually have an ability to get people to believe lies. And so now you don't even know what's true and what's false that's coming out of your mouth. You just say things to get people to believe you. I want you to watch this. So the, 
The best of you is the worst of you redeemed. That's actually a gift that's been hijacked by the devil. You say, Pastor, lying is? No, 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 no. Listen to me. Hear me. It's the ability to speak things and get people to believe what you're saying. That's actually a gift of an evangelist. And the enemy has hijacked that and gotten you to speak lies to people instead of speaking truth to people. And so the Lord is redeeming your mouth and you are going to begin to speak truth. You're not going to speak lies any longer. You're not going to speak falsehood. You're going to begin to speak truth and not just your truth, but the truth and the gift of the evangelist will be released in you. For some, for some of you in the house, it's sexual impurity sexual impurity you say pastor how is that redeemed it's passion that's misplaced so the lord is actually going to redeem that right now you are a worshiper that's who you are your worship is going to begin to go to the next level your worship is going to become extravagant god is redeeming things in your life Father, I thank you right now that you are the God of redemption. Can we just stand all across this auditorium? I don't know what it is for you, but would you just lift a hand and say, God, take the worst of me. Take the thing that the enemy's been trying to beat me up with. Take the, th take the thing that, that take my image self. God, I don't want to live out of a false self any longer. I don't want to live a life that's trying to just please people, that's trying not to offend anyone. I want to live out of my core identity. I I want to accept what Jesus says about me that you are who your father says you are in the name of Jesus that you are you are you are truth of the father thank you Lord we thank you Lord for releasing identity in the house today everybody look right here I want you, I want to read the last part of this verse this is what happens when we begin to when we begin to wake up and sometimes confronting things about ourselves that's not comfortable right that's not comfortable but the lord will actually use that to something in you just woke up it just woke up now i want to read this over you this is the word of god remember then what you have received and heard keep that repent of the bad stuff if you don't wake up, I'll come as a thief, and you'll not know what hour I will come against you. Yet there are still a few names. Names? You hear me? God's still in the business of changing names. People who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. That's what the Lord says about you. You walk in white. You are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments. And I will never blot out their name out of the book of life. I will confess their name before my father and before his angels. So where does all this yearning for identity come from? It's actually a good desire. You're yearning for image, but it's not the image of the world that you're yearning for. It's that you are actually created in God's image. That desire to be loved is from the Lord, and you are receiving now the image of God over your life and what you were created for and destined for. So let me just bless you with that as we close today, Father. And, and if there's anyone here, if there's somebody here that doesn't know you, that hasn't received that new name, would you just pray these words after me as I pray them out loud? Just say, Jesus, I repent. I come to the cross. I don't want to live out of my false self any longer. I'm done trying to please people and wondering if they like me or not. I want to please you. So I repent of my sin and I come and I accept you as Lord of my life.
come into my heart. Help me to live wide awake to the love of God and fully alive to my purpose. And now I bless this house, that they are a house that walks in the image of God, that they do not walk in the image of the world or the image that they think that others want them to live up to, but they live out of the image that they are son and da- sons and daughters of the Most High God. They look like their father. They have their father's eyes. They have their father's destiny. And so I speak that image over them. I bless them in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen. Well, I hope the service made a difference in your life. And if you made a decision to follow Jesus, we would love to know. All you have to do is text alive to 94,000. We have some resources we'd love to give you as you begin your journey of following him. So... You know what day it is? Do you know what day it is? I asked you first. I do. Oh, well, I just wanted to see if you knew. Well, I want to know if you have a plan. Okay, so um, what day it is on three? Ready? One, two, three. It's our anniversary! anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> it's our anniversary! And you're going to do what? Dinner? Whatever it is you want me to do. I want a steak. <laughs> you want a steak? I kind of do. What kind of steak? Just a good one. T-bone, a ribeye. I don't know. I just want to go to have a good steak. I don't care. Okay. Okay. I just want it to taste good. And and then I want, like, a card. You want a card? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. I opened up a card the other day in front of somebody. Yeah, yeah. And they gave you the card? They gave me the card, and I'm opening it, and, like, there's money in it. And I feel like I can't look at the money. (laughs) I feel like that's a thing. It's sometimes, like, it feels awkward. Yeah, you're like, uh, let me read the note. Uh, Like, yeah, but the card's more important, but I'm really excited about the money. Thank you very much for the money. Um, So maybe you just say thank you more in the thank you card afterwards? Yeah. But why is that? Can't we just be like, dude, you gave me money. High five. Yeah. I'll high five you on that. I'll take some money. I can do that to you. Yeah, I know. But, like, with other people, you don't know the rules. So you're kind of like, hey, I don't know what to do. Maybe it's just you and me. Maybe we're the only ones that feel that way. I don't know that that's accurate. No? I always feel awkward when our kids do the opposite. Oh, you're right. I do. And they're like, and I tell them, read the card, read the and they're card. They're like, money! <laughs> Let me go run off. I don't even acknowledge you, but I got money. Look at me. <laughs> Yay! Um, we probably should teach them better than that. Yeah. Let's do that. Hey, kids! Make sure that if you ever get money in a card, that you like, Read the card. Yeah, acknowledge the person more than the money. All right. Well, life lessons with the gosses. Mm -hmm. Read the card. Have a great week. Mm